Hello and welcome to today's video about public service. This video is brought to you by the Bush Education Team at the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum. My name is Ivy and you'll be hearing my voice throughout this whole video, along with other people. <laughs> this video has four parts. Our Archivist Corner interview, a lesson, an activity, and a craft. First, we will begin with our Archivist Corner interview. Hello, Ms. Wheeler. On behalf of our viewers and the Bush education team here at the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum, thank you for meeting with us today and answering a few of our questions. Ms. Wheeler here is the Supervisory Archivist. We are excited to be able to ask her some questions and share her answers with you today. So I guess let's go ahead and just get started, jump right into this. What are your favorite primary sources from the George H.W. Bush archives? Oh, that's an easy one for me. It's the World War II letters. I love those. It, it really gives us a sense not only of world history, but of the social history of the time. And it really lets you get a, a glimpse into George Bush's heart and his soul, which makes me think that uh, this is a little bit what young men of the era were feeling, my father included. And you can tell from the letters the different emotions that were going through. I mean, he was scared, he was nervous, he was homesick, uh, but he was also filled with pride and uh, excitement and self-determination. And, and he had a real patriotism that he was willing to give up his life essentially for his country. And so it's, it's really, they're, they're beautiful letters. I encourage everybody to try and take a look at them. That was awesome. Yeah, I've read a couple of those letters. They're, they're pointed. Some of them have nearly brought me to tears. Um, can you please walk us through a day on the job? Okay, well, uh, the staff archivists come in for the day and what they do is they pull primary documents from our collections and they, what they're doing is reading them for content to uh, examine them against our Freedom of Information Act exemptions. And so in other words, what they want to do is read them line by line and be sure that we don't release anything that would be sensitive, say things like somebody's social security number or a law enforcement information or even classified materials. So they read for that. And obviously we want to release as much as possible, but we also need to protect very sensitive information. And once they do that, uh, they look for preservation issues and we take any kind of corrective uh, measures that we need to. That would be things like, say, um, tissue paper, fax machine type of things that might deteriorate with age or important uh, original signatures from heads of state and those sort of things that we remove. Once they've done all those administrative tasks, then they write a finding aid that describes the records and then we're able to release them to the public. That's really cool. I feel like I have a much better understanding now of what the archives do. Tied to that is how do the archives serve the public? Well, obviously our main task is to serve our researchers, which is anybody from a professor to a student to the general public. And so um, what we try to do is make these materials available in as quick a fashion as possible. So we, we basically want to give everybody a ready access to what we call essential elements of our foundation of our country. How do these documents in the archives get sorted? Well, that's an interesting question because actually these documents come to us directly from the White House. We have uh, different NARA employees in Washington that go to the White House, take them right out of the drawer of the staff members, and we're receiving them here in College Station in exactly that order. So when we open a box to start processing, sometimes the records are prearranged by the staff member. They're very good, and they can be prearranged alphabetically by subject matter or chronologically by date. And sometimes we open a box and we find all kinds of surprises, like a half-eaten sandwich or <laughs> something. You just never know. It's, and that makes the job fun as well as interesting. And so in a case like that, where they're not prearranged in any order, 
Our archivist will assess the materials and try to arrange them in a good order so that the researcher will be able to find the materials they need. A half-eaten sandwich? <laughs> we have found food. We have found food. Oh my goodness. Okay, that's, that is quite the cool story. Okay. <laughs> is there anything else you would like us to know? Yes, actually, I'd like to say that working in a presidential library is an honor and a privilege for me because these are the materials that the future generations are going to be able to use to write history and to tell uh, what our citizens need to know in order to move forward in a better manner. I love the passion you have <laughs> for it all. All right, Ms. Wheeler, it is our understanding that you joined the museum early on around the time it opened. Can you tell us a little bit about what that looked like? Oh, sure. I actually came to the library before it opened. It was uh, several months before it opened. And I came out to talk to a graduate student who worked there. And he's actually now our deputy director, Robert Holzweiss. And he gave me a tour through the unfinished building. And that was fun because, well, we were stepping over wires and paint cans and uh, there was cases everywhere. And it, it was a lot of fun particularly when we got to the collections department because he showed me the bicycles that the Bushes rode when they were on duty in China. And I remembered that there was a very famous historical photograph of the Bushes on their bicycles uh, while they were there. And I was standing there looking right there at the bicycles and thinking to myself, working here would be like touching history. And it's just such an, as a historian, that is the most exciting thing that can happen to you. And so I showed up in a few days with some paint clothes and I helped paint and I helped uh, polish artifacts. And so it was, it was a whole lot of fun. And then on when we actually had dedication day, there were thousands of people out there on the grounds of the library. And I was sitting over in a section with the staff members and again, I was just, I sort of had to pinch myself to believe that here, Debbie Wheeler was sitting at a presidential library watching former presidents talk about the contributions that President Bush had given to the country in all his years of service. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, I'm now a part of history because this is going to be, you know, documented from now on about the presidential library and it's going to be here forever. And that was a really incredible feeling, uh, like I say, as a historian particularly. But um, we went on from there. I actually was still in graduate school and so I worked at the de front desk selling tickets. I went on to do reservations and help uh, tours, became the director's secretary. And then after graduation, I was promoted up to staff archivist where I actually got to sit there and hold those historic documents in my hand and begin to read them. And now I feel that I have my greatest privilege uh, to be the supervisory archivist and be able to direct things in the textual and audiovisual department to make things available for the public. So it, it truly has been the highlight of my career. I really, that's really cool, especially how like you began here and you just ended up way up here and just the whole story of the wires. <laughs> well, I will tell you this, it helps you to appreciate the job that everybody does at the library. I feel like I've worked in so many different departments and I really, I think it does help. It helps to understand the whole workings of the library. Everybody's job is important. What advice would you give children at home for organizing their writings and drawings? Oh, very important question, because if you start at a young age, you'll be okay. There's actually a, a two specific organizational techniques, and what they can do is take their creative projects, and they can either arrange them, um, you know, alphabetically by the subject matter, that, or they can do it by the date that they created it. But the main thing is to try to keep it in some semblance of order that they know how to find so they can enjoy it again themselves and they can share it with others. So that's my main advice. Just have a plan and follow it. Good advice. All right. Is there anything we did not think to ask that you would like to share with us? Well, yes, I'd like to kind of address the benefit of having a presidential library in our community because it's not everyone who has the privilege of being able to just drive down the road 
to visit a museum and a, an archive where we hold historical documents. We tell the story of not just our president, but the history of the presidency and our country. Uh, most people have to drive great distances in order to access anything like that. And as we can see in our community, not only uh, is it good for the people in our area, but we're in like a tri-city area. So within a couple of hours drive of so many people, and what this is good for our community, even economically, it's more what I think of is it helps us to be able to share our history with our, our citizens around us and with our children and with a greater understanding of what happened, not only with our president, but in context of our own uh, collective history will make us for a much stronger and healthier nation. Well, those are lovely answers and insights. And I just appreciate so much you taking the time to meet with us today. So oh, thank, thank you again. You. I appreciate you working with me. I hope you all enjoyed listening to Mrs. Wheeler's answers as much as I did. Mrs. Wheeler's career is a great example of how one can serve the public good. And following the theme of public service, I am turning the video over to David. He is going to speak to us about President George H.W. Bush's legacy of public service. Howdy everyone. In today's lesson, we will be discussing some of the public service work that George H.W. Bush performed. In this lesson, we will only focus on three positions in George H.W. Bush's life that relate to public service. So let's hop right in. The three aspects of George H.W. Bush's life that we will focus on today are as him as a congressman from 1967 to 1971, an ambassador from 1971 to 1973, and then as president of the U.S. from 1989 to 1993. The first public service aspect of George H.W. Bush that we will look at today is him as a congressman. Bush served on the Texas 7th Congressional District. In this position, he had the ability to vote for laws in the House of Representatives. He used this power to support laws such as the Civil Rights Act of 1968, a law that at that time was not particularly popular due to the racism of that time. This new act helped encourage equality among all people in the U.S. This act stated that anyone who attacked someone or intimidated them in any way due to their color, race, or religion could be prosecuted. This act also helped with the housing discrimination and gave houses to those in need without fear of being discriminated against because of race or any other reason. And lastly, this put a ban on rioting. As a congressman, Bush also played a part in the Republican response to the State of the Union Address. In the address to the Democratic president, Bush encouraged America to rise up and began to take fiscal responsibility. The second public service aspect of George H.W. Bush's life that we will look at is him as an ambassador to the United Nations. As ambassador, Bush served under the Nixon administration. During the period in which he served, the U.S. was working to calm things down between Communist Russia and the People's Republic of China. They were fighting to help bring an end to the Cold War. And George H.W. Bush helped to play a big part in bringing about this peace. Another key part as ambassador that George H.W. Bush played was in the fight against genocide in Pakistan. At the time, Bush was an ambassador and the Pakistani president Yahya Khan was waging genocide on East Pakistan. In order to help fight this, George H.W. Bush supported an Indian motion at the UN General Assembly, which condemned the Pakistani government of Yahya Khan for waging genocide in East Pakistan. East Pakistan is modern-day Bangladesh. 
In a quote, he said, Tradition, which we have supported, that the human rights question transcended domestic jurisdiction and should be freely debated. Bush strongly believed in all human rights and cared for all people. It was for this reason that he strongly supported the fight against genocide in East Pakistan, despite the fact that the Nixon administration was supporting the Pakistani government due to political reasons. George H.W. Bush stood up for what he believed was right, to fight for human rights, instead of looking for his own personal political gain. The last public service aspect of George H.W. Bush that we will look at is him as the 41st President of the United States of America. One of the great public service acts that Bush performed was to sign an executive order to support predominantly black colleges. He signed this executive order on April 28, 1989 in order to help support HBCU, historically black colleges and universities. Bush wanted to provide a better quality education for these schools and to help increase federal funding for them, especially in a time where this opinion was not as popular. Another one of the great service acts that Bush did as president was to sign the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act was a federal law to help control air pollution. It was one of the first laws enacted that supported environmentalism in this way before. The act was broken up into various titles which focused on different things. For example, one title provided technical and financial assistance from the federal government to support preventing air pollution in the states. This guaranteed federal funding. Another title focused on emission standards for moving sources and monitoring and, lim and limiting these emissions. Overall, the Clean Air Act acted as a huge stepping stone in the U.S. in leading more toward becoming environmentally friendly in its laws. And George H.W. Bush played a huge part in this. Another huge act of service that Bush did while he was president was to sign the Americans with Disabilities Act. If you have ever seen a disability ramp or rails leading up to an entrance of a building, or if you have seen a larger stall in the bathroom with rails, these are all to help those with disabilities, and they are all due to the Americans with Disabilities Act. This act prohibits any form of discrimination based on disabilities. It also forces businesses and public places to make accommodations for people with disabilities, whether they were employees or patrons. The act was broken up into various titles, one for employment, one for public entities and transportation, one for commercial facilities and other public accommodations, one for telecommunications, and lastly, one for any other miscellaneous provisions that may have occurred. The Americans with Disabilities Act was not only influential in the United States, but also has been used as a model in several other countries to make their own form of a Disabilities Act. This act forever changed the way the U.S. and the world treated those with, just, with disabilities. President George H.W. Bush was a huge supporter of equal rights for those with disabilities. He often would spend time with children or people with disabilities and give them tours of the White House. And as he got older and eventually was confined to a wheelchair, he would crack jokes about how thankful he was for having signed the act and for installing these disabilities ramps so that he could get into a building on his wheelchair. George H.W. Bush will forever go down in history as the president that made this possible for all those with disabilities. Another action that George H.W. Bush took toward environmentalism during his presidency was in supporting the Earth Summit of 1992. At this summit, he signed the Earth Pledge, a pledge encouraging countries to begin moving towards environmentally friendly means in the public sector. The pledge served as a symbol of the actions that people of power and political influence would take to help make the world a better place. Some of these issues included alternative sources, public transportation, environmental concern, and limited water supply. And now the last thing that we will cover in his presidency is the signing of the Grand Canyon Navajo 
Power Plant Air Quality Agreement. George H.W. Bush once again stepped up to the plate as an environmentalist and fought for the preservation of the Grand Canyon and the air of the area. In signing this agreement, Bush guaranteed lower emissions and also supported the preservation of tribal jobs and promised to improve the conditions of the Grand Canyon. George H.W. Bush worked hard in his presidency to help serve the public and the environment. To close off, I have an activity planned for us to do. So I would recommend grabbing a sheet of paper and a pen so you can go ahead and write down some of these ideas. So the first question that I wanted to ask is, what can you do to help in public service right now? And then what laws or acts would you pass if you were in power to help the environment? Write down these goals and then begin to implement them today. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you, David. That was an excellent overview of President Bush's public service history. Next, we are going to use what we have learned and narrow in our focus to environmental issues. There will be several times where scissors are used throughout the rest of this video. We recommend adult supervision at all times and the use of children's safety blunt tip scissors. For this next part, I am turning the video over to Alyssa. She is going to lead you all in an activity that explains the cap part of cap and trade. This is an extremely important concept in environmental policy. This activity can be done with some paper. Scissors are optional as we will show the activity both with scissors and without scissors. So without further ado, here is Alyssa. Howdy. So today we're going to be working on the activity portion of this video. Um, we are going to be working on an activity about cap and trade. And so what is cap and trade? So the Clean Air Act was signed into law by President Bush in 1990. And what this did was it limited the amount of mercury that was allowed um, to be produced by the power plants. So this is good because too much mercury um, exposure can be very harmful to both humans and animals. So cap and trade comes into play because this was the method that was used in order to limit that mercury. So a good way to think of it is that um, paper, you know, paper, so you're going to, you draw things on the paper and say you cut something out. Well, that leftover paper is the pollution that is left over and there is mercury that is in that pollution which is like i said what causes that harm to both humans and animals so with that example that is the activity that we are going to be performing today and so the cap is um part of cap and trade is what we're going to be focusing on during this activity um, so what you're going to need is two sheets of paper. It doesn't matter what color, obviously, but two sheets of paper. You're going to need something to write with, whether it be a marker, a pen, color, whatever you'd like. And lastly, you're going to need scissors. Now remember that if you do use scissors, choose to use scissors, you must have a parent or guardian permission in order to use them. Please, we do ask that. Um, if you're not able to use scissors, scissors or you don't have scissors, feel free to use colors. And so at any point that I ask you to go ahead and um, uh, cut out the, the, I'm sorry, the shapes, then you can go ahead and color in the, the shapes um, instead of cutting, out the, cutting them out. Okay, so first things first, we're going to get comfortable. Um, so you're going to want to go ahead and grab your writing utensil and we're going to first go ahead and draw a star and in case you don't remember what a star looks like I'm going to go ahead and show you right here there's a star okay so go ahead and draw that anywhere you'd like on the paper don't don't draw it too big just go ahead and draw it a small decent size and remember you know no one's an artist here so don't worry about it being perfect just draw 
however you'd like. Okay, next you're gonna go ahead and draw a square anywhere on the paper once again. Okay, next you're gonna go ahead and draw a triangle. Next, you're gonna go ahead and draw a circle. Next, you're gonna go ahead and draw a trapezoid. And lastly, you're gonna go ahead and draw a little squiggly box type thing. So once you have that, um, next we're going to go ahead and if you do have your permission to use the scissors, you're going to go ahead and cut out each of the um, each of the shapes out of the thing, out of the paper, I'm sorry. And um, yeah, so go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and give you a couple seconds to do that. And if you were unable to get some scissors, then feel free to just color in. I mean, obviously it doesn't have to be perfect, just that way you can kind of get a brief little view of what it would look like without these shapes. Okay, so you go ahead and color those in, and it can also kind of look like that. I know it's not, not very, artistic, but that's okay. All right, so for those of you who are not finished um, um, cutting them out yet, feel cutting the shapes out yet, feel free to go ahead and pause the video while you continue to cut them out. And so what I want you to notice here is how big of a space that is left over um, after you cut this out. So this space, the, this excess paper, is the pollution that is being released and that excess mercury that is um, not needed, um, which all goes back to harming people and animals. So what we're going to need to do is be more efficient about it. So in order to do that, um, we are going to better use our resources. So... On the paper, we're going to go ahead and redraw those shapes. However, now we're going to strategically place the shapes in a way that we can maximize the space that we have, okay? So once again, we're gonna go ahead and draw those exact same shapes, just bigger and more, strate more strategically placed, okay? All right, so let's start again, once again, with the star. And personally, I'm just going to go ahead and turn my paper landscape to see what I can get from there. But like I said, it's however you feel that you could most strategically and efficiently use your space. Okay? All right. So let's start with the star once again. I'm going to hold this for a second just so you see. Next, go ahead and draw your square. And just so that way you know, it's okay if you're, um, like, if they touch, if your shapes touch, as long as they do not overlap each other, because remember, we are going to be cutting them out again. So as long as they don't overlap, it's perfectly fine. So next we're gonna go ahead and draw our triangle. Next we're gonna go ahead and draw our circle. And then we're gonna go ahead and draw our trapezoid. And then 
then lastly, we're gonna go ahead and draw our little squiggly line for squiggly box. So we're gonna go ahead, this is what it looks like. I know that looks like a little overlap, but I promise they're just lines, it's okay. <laughs> um, so this is kind of what it should look like, or, yeah, <laughs> just. Um, next, we're going to go ahead and use the scissors to once again either cut them out with permission or um, color them in. So while you get a head start on cutting them, we're going to go ahead and color them in just a hair for those who don't have the scissors. So do you notice how between the first one and the second one, there's a lot less pollution? There's a lot less excess paper? Yeah? So that is, like I said, the pollution that is being released. And so just in case you were able to cut it also, this is the leftover paper from our second more efficiently placed um, energy. So remember, our, our shapes are the energy that is being uh, released or created, I'm sorry. So this is the, the smaller one or the one that has a lot less, a lot more pollution left over, whereas this is the one that we just did right now. You can see there's a big difference there. Yeah? All right, so with that, I'm really hoping that you get a better understanding of what cap and trade is, more specifically cap in this sense. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and transition into the craft part of the video. Um, go ahead and recycle your paper, recycle the paper that you have used, and go ahead and put your markers away is as well as the scissors um, be sure to give these back to your parent or guardian so that way they can ensure that these are responsibly put away all right okay I hope you really enjoyed this video and got some useful information out of it and I hope you have a great day goodbye thank you Alyssa well what do you think were you able to design an efficient method for marking out your shapes I challenge you to keep playing around with it to maximize your efficiency. Next, I will be handing the video over to Ashton. She is going to demonstrate two different ways to make a bird feeder. When you choose to make these crafts, please have an adult on hand to assist you. All right? Okay, enjoy. Hey y'all, for our first activity we are going to be making a birdhouse out of an empty water bottle. You can also make it out of an empty milk jug, milk carton, or soda bottle as well. So some of the tools that you will be needing today is your water bottle, a hot glue gun which is going to require parent supervision and parent help, some scissors, a screwdriver, some twine, ribbon, or string, and some paint or spray paint, as well as a paintbrush. So for our first step, we are going to make a tiny cut about one third of the way down the water bottle with our scissors. So it helps if you sort of crunch it up and then make your cut. Now that we have a tiny cut, we can fit our scissors in and cut all the way around the water bottle until we have two pieces. Awesome. Now that we have two pieces, firstly, we are going to want to remove this ring off the top of the water bottle. 
And you can do that by asking your parents to help you cut it, or you can just try and slide it off to the top depending on how loose it is. Now you're going to want to cut a tiny little rectangle or doorway out of the front of your water bottle. You don't want to cut all the way down, but almost to the very bottom. And this is going to be how the birds can get into your birdhouse. So you can see I've cut all the way down and then I'm going to cut this off. Now that we have our water bottle in two and our doorway cut out, we can go ahead and paint or spray paint our water bottle. I have already done this. So here is my painted water bottle. And so for the next step, we are going to want, with parents' help, to put hot glue around the top edge of the bottom portion of the water bottle and then quickly place the top portion on top to allow the hot glue to stick. Now I'm going to need a little bit more of hot glue. And then firmly hold it for a couple seconds. You're going to want to use a low heat hot glue gun to prevent from melting the bottle. Awesome. So now that we have the bottle portion or the home almost finished, we need to fix the roof or our cap. We're going to want to poke a small hole through the top of our cap so that we can fit some string through it so that we can hang the birdhouse. You'll want to ask your parents to help with this as well, but you are just going to take a screwdriver and press firmly in the middle of your cap. Until you have poked a hole all the way down. Just like this. So now that we have the hole, we're going to go ahead and cut our string or ribbon or twine. We're going to line up the ends so that we have a little loop. And we're going to fit both ends through the top of the water bottle cap. Now we're going to want to have about this much left on the other side and we're going to tie it in a knot twice. This should help prevent the twine from being able to be pulled back through. And now we can connect our cap you can cut off the long, longer portion of the string as well. And then we can connect our cap to our water bottle. And there you have your bird house. You can put a little bird seat at the bottom to help attract the birds. And then you can go ahead and hang it on a branch outside. If you want to decorate it some more, you could also put some stickers around the water bottle as well. For our last activity today, we are going to be making a bird treat out of pipe cleaner and Cheerios. This is an allergen-free bird treat, so it contains no peanut butter or other allergy-inducing ingredients. So the four tools you'll need today is going to be a pipe cleaner, some Cheerios, some twine or ribbon, 
and some scissors. So we're gonna start off with our pipe cleaner and the shape we want to make today is a heart. So we're gonna start with the bottom and we're going to bend it into a V, making sure that our ends are almost even if we can. Then to make the top, you're going to try and make your two ends meet in the middle. So we see we have a heart right here we're going to bend these two ends so that the heart stays in place and then you can pop them back out a little bit. Now before we tie these two middle pieces together, we want to fill the heart with Cheerios because that's gonna be the bird treat. So you're gonna take your Cheerios and string them onto your pipe cleaner. And you're just going to keep stacking them until they fill all the way up on this side and then you'll fill them up on this side. You want to leave a little bit of room so that you can tie the pipe cleaner together about this much on each end. And I'll show you what like that looks like in a minute. So once you've finished putting all your Cheerios on, your heart should look a little bit like this. So now all we need to do is tie the two pipe cleaners together. We're going to do this by putting the, crossing the pipe cleaners and then twisting and twisting them around each other. Until we reach the end. Then we can fold the end up. Perfect. So now our Cheerios won't fall off. Now you could hang it up on a branch like this, but you can also use your twine or ribbon and cut it using your scissors or asking your parents to help you cut it. And we're going to thread it through our heart. And we want to make a double knot so that it doesn't come undone. So now you can hang it on a branch outside and wait for the birds to come. Thank you, Ashton. Those are both neat ways to make a bird feeder. So I have an easy challenge for our capable audience. If you make a bird feeder, I challenge you to keep an observation log. Document through writing or drawing pictures, your choice, what animals come to visit the feeder and what they do on their visits. Observation is an important scientific skill that can be used to help others. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to us at bush.education at nara.gov.